And Father, today we need to know that love. Our hearts need to be overwhelmed by your love. Our minds need to be changed by your love. So God, we simply ask that every person in this room would, would just know how much you love them. And that we would hear your word and we would walk out of here different because your love never fails. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. I invite you to take your Bibles or your Bible apps and turn to the book of Philippians chapter 3. Uh, Philippians chapter 3, if you don't have a Bible with you uh, or a Bible app on your device, uh, grab one of the Bibles in the pews around you, look just like this one. Uh, turn to page 1249, you will find Philippians chapter 3 right there. And if you need a Bible, uh, you don't have the Word of God, you want to, to own a Bible and read it, then please take one of these as our gift we want you to have the Word of God and to let it be part of your life. Hey, I'm really happy you're here. Uh, you guys happy you're here today? Yeah, yeah good, because it's the middle of July and we live in Lake Havasu City and most of us would like to go somewhere cooler. Of course, everywhere is cooler, so... Uh, you know, uh, this is a time of year that people like to travel, and so uh, either you probably just got back from a trip someplace, or you're gearing up to go on a trip someplace, so here's what I want you to do. I want you to take a moment and find someone near you that's not your family, not somebody who's traveled with you, and, and I want you to tell them where you're about to go or where you just got back from. In other words, where'd you just return from or what your next trip is. Ready, set, Go. You know, I listen to you guys. This may have been the favorite question ever. <laughs> Nobody wants to stop. I, I don't, you know, it's like a one-word answer. Where did you last go? Where are you going to next? You know, Williams or whatever. And, and uh, you guys are like writing trip reviews for TripAdvisor. You know? <laughs> Talking about favorite restaurants. You have to go here. It's right there on the beach. It's going to be perfect. You know, so uh, the Apostle Paul traveled a lot. In fact, when you, when you read through the Bible and the story of his life, it is a life of travel. I mean, his life was changed on the road to Damascus. He was going there to persecute Christians, and Jesus met him and changed his life. He went out on three missionary journeys all over what's now uh, Asia Minor and Greece and, and that part of the world. Uh, and then he was arrested and, and he traveled to Rome to stand trial before the emperor. And on the way, uh, the ship he was on sank. He understood travel, but he's writing this letter from Rome in prison, uh, un, you know, unjustly imprisoned, and he's writing to his friends in Philippi, uh, and he wants to encourage them about the most important trip that you can take. Philippians chapter 3, beginning in verse 12, the apostle writes, not that I have already obtained this or am already perfect. He's talking about eternal life. But I press on to make it my own. Because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own. But one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Let those who, of us who are mature think this way. And if in anything you think otherwise, God will reveal that also to you. Only let us hold true to what we have attained. Paul makes it clear that following Jesus is a journey. A journey. I mean, Paul says, look, I haven't arrived yet. He's pressing on toward a destination, toward a goal, towards a prize. Kind of sounds like a journey, doesn't it? He's traveling somewhere. So I want you to know that if you call yourself a follower of Jesus, if you believe that Jesus is the Son of God, the Savior of the world, you believe that he died on the cross to pay for your sins and was raised from the dead, and you have made a commitment to follow Jesus with your life, then you are on this journey. Following Jesus is a journey. Think about it. Uh, Jesus' invitation to people all over the place was what? Follow me. Follow me. Follow me. Come with me. I'll take you on a journey. 
And, and this is crucial for us to grasp this if we're going to do this Jesus thing. If you're going to be a Christian, not just call yourself a Christian, then you need to grasp that we follow Jesus wherever he leads. Wherever he leads, uh, that, that's what we're to do. So, so Jesus leads and we follow. That, that, that's right. Now, we can answer that in church because it's obvious kind of the answer that we give. Uh, but the truth is we never stop following Jesus this side of heaven. That, that, that's what Paul's talking about. He hadn't arrived. He hadn't obtained it yet. He hadn't gotten there. And we don't arrive either. We're on a journey following Jesus that doesn't end in this world. And, and because of that, at Calvary, we believe uh, that one of our core values is change. It's change. That may sound strange to you, but we put it this way. It is impossible to follow Jesus and stay where you are. It's impossible. You think about it. Jesus is calling us on this dynamic journey of life change. And so if you're going to follow Jesus, you can't stay the same. Your life is going to change. It's going to change in lots of ways. For instance, following Jesus means that our destination is different. Because of sin in our life, because of our rebellion, because of our failures, we deserve hell. For the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So even though our destination was hell, it's been changed by Jesus, and now our destination is heaven. Not because of what we've done, but because of what Jesus did for us on the cross. That's a gift of grace. And our values are changed. They're different because of Jesus. When we're following Jesus, we don't just go where he goes, but we do what he does. And so our values have become values of love. To love the Lord our God with all of our heart and soul and mind and strength. To love our neighbor as ourselves, Even to love our enemies. I mean, I know that sounds crazy, but Jesus said, you have heard it said, love your neighbor and hate your enemies. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you that you may be sons of your Father which is in heaven. It's a different value Used to believe this way, used to have this kind of value. Now it's changed and we value love. We value forgiveness. Just as in Christ, God forgave us. Doesn't matter what they've done or how they've hurt you, we're called to forgive. That's one of the values that's changed. We're called to be generous, to give to God out of gratitude and thanksgiving for all the blessings that he's given to us and to bless others in Jesus' name. We're called to serve Jesus said, the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. And, and he says, if I, your master, have served you, you're to serve one another. You see, our values are different, but our purpose is different. We don't live for ourselves and what we want any longer. Now, we live as servants of Christ, embracing God's mission over our purpose. In other words, we are to be about our father's business. It's kind of cool when you think about it. He adopts us as sons and daughters of God when we believe in Jesus as Savior and Lord. And then he says, hey, I want you to come in and share in my business. <laughs> What's God's business? It's life change, isn't it? It's redemption. That's why here at Calvary we say, hey, look, we exist to lead people to a life-changing relationship with Jesus Christ through the love of his people and the power of his truth. That's what we're about because that's God's business and our purpose has changed. And then our direction is different. Our direction has changed. No longer are we just wandering about life headed wherever we want to go, but following Jesus is an upward journey. If we're following Jesus. It leads someplace and that's leading up. Up. Isn't that what Paul said in verse 14? He said, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. God's calling us someplace. Now, we know the eventual destination is heaven. But right now, God is calling us to follow Jesus to a life of love. A life that is filled with purpose, that is overflowing with hope and joy. It's an abundant life. So if you're a follower of Christ today, let me ask you this question. What direction is your life heading? What direction is your life heading? Because each one of us determines the direction of our lives. Can I just be honest with you? We don't control a whole lot of stuff, but you control 100% of the direction of your life. 
I mean, you don't control life circumstances, right? We rail about the why me? Why is this happening to me? Why is this stuff going on? We don't control that stuff. You don't control what happens to you, the, the, the things that other people do to you, the, the random acts of life, whether you're audited or not. You don't control that. You don't control the economy. You can't determine what's going to happen in Greece or China or, or whether terrorists are going to blow something up. You don't control that. You don't even control your family as much as you want to, right? Because you've got children. Do you control your kids? No, you don't. You try, but you can't do it. I mean, it doesn't take long before they're already being defiant. And, and, and you realize that there's this tension between what you want them to do and what they're going to do. You don't control them. By the way, you might as well not try and control them. You need to help them become independent little people that, that make good choices, that make good decisions. Because you control one thing about your life, and that is what direction it's headed. So what direction is your life heading? Um, we live in Lake Havasu City. If you're a guest here or a visitor here, then you may not understand this because you look at our map and just go, who created this mess? Right? But if you live in Lake Havasu City, you understand that um, you can get from point A to point B multiple ways. Right? Hey, you got options. You got choices. Like from my house to the church, uh, there's three different distinct routes I can take. I can go up the hill and around. I can go down the hill to the highway. I can go right across the middle of town. All three routes, about 30 seconds to a minute difference on how I get here. 30 seconds to a minute, and that's even dependent on lights and traffic and all that kind of stuff. So, uh, you know, I can come any way that I want, but I get to the same destination. If you're a follower of Jesus, that's the key point. If you're following Jesus, then uh, we all have different experiences. We all have different pain. We all have different hurts. We all have different uh, uh, ways in our life that God has communicated to us and, and ways that we failed him and ways that he's redeemed us. But as long as you're following Jesus on an upward journey, you're on the right path. Now, a lot of churches will try to tell you, you have to do it this way. Here's the prescribed path. Here's the only way you can get from Chad's house to the church. And so you got to go this way. And they want to say, okay, you got to do this. You got to do this. You got to stop doing this. You got to show up this time. And, and that doesn't work for a lot of people. I mean, if that's the route you want to go, then that works really well. But if that's not the route you want to go, a lot of times they try to force that on us. And I'm just going to tell you, here at Calvary, we don't try to force that on you. We want you to listen to the voice of Jesus and, and, and follow him in his steps the way that he leads you. Because we realize that the Holy Spirit is in your life and he's going to guide you. He's going to lead you. He's going to convict you. He's going to change you on his time schedule and his way. And as long as you can look at your life and you can see that you are following Jesus on an upward journey toward the prize, then rejoice in that. However, I think if we're followers of Christ, we know when we're headed in the wrong direction. I think we know it. Um, it's kind of like driving to Phoenix. You guys ever, ever driven to Phoenix or been in a car that went to Phoenix? It works better if you guys actually answer the question. Okay, how many of you have been to Phoenix, my car? Thank you. I, this whole section was like, we're sleeping. We're not even going to answer the question. And then there's a bunch of you who are like, yeah, I've been to what are you embarrassed about going to Phoenix? It's just a place, all right? All right, if you go to Phoenix, you know that you, you leave here, you've, you've got options on how you're going to get to Phoenix, right? But they all go through Parker, right? Because you're going to go through Parker, and then you're going to decide, I'm going to go through Baus and Wickenburg. Anybody like that route? Like the Wickenburg route? Some of you do. Okay, or maybe you go through Baus and pick up I-10. Some of you like that Vicksburg Road route? Yeah, you like that? And then, you know, the rest of us go through Quartzsite and pick up I-10 there because you can drive faster sooner, right? Anybody the Quartzsite way? I like that way because I know where the bathrooms are. So uh, anyway, but it doesn't matter. You know I'm going to go down through Parker and then I'm going to get to Phoenix one of those ways. But if you tell me I'm going to Phoenix and then you head north on 95, you're either lying or an idiot, Right? Because that is not the way to Phoenix. We all know that. Now, you can, make, you can correct your course. You know, you hit the I-40, you can go, oh, I'm going to go east and go through Kingman and go down through Wickenburg that way. Way out of the way, but you can get there. You go, oh, I'm going to go through Flagstaff. Why would you do that? I don't know. But you, just, you can make it long. You, you can correct your course. But if you get to I-40 and turn west, are you going to Phoenix? Nope, you're not. We know that. 
in our lives, we know when we're headed in the wrong direction. The Holy Spirit is reminding us that. He's calling us to change uh, the, the course of our life so that we can be on this upward journey. So followers of Christ, is your life headed in the right direction? Let me just get real specific. What direction is your marriage headed today? Where is your life leading your children today? Is your integrity moving upward? Or are you compromising? Is your morality following Jesus on that upward journey, or are you descending into the gutter? Are you getting closer to Christ, or are you drifting away? Because you and you alone determine the direction of your life. And following Jesus is an upward journey. So let's talk about keys for a successful trip. Paul talks about two keys to a successful journey uh, in following Jesus. The first one involves forgetting. Forgetting. Look at verse 13 again. He says, brothers, I don't consider that I have made it my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead. Isn't that an interesting statement that Paul makes? Forgetting what lies behind. Uh, Paul is not advocating selective amnesia. So the next time you can't find your glasses or your keys, don't say you're being biblical. Okay? I left them someplace behind me. I don't know where. Right? And Paul's not trying to downplay the significance of the past. He's not trying to say the past is unimportant what he's telling us is don't become captives to your past. Don't be a prisoner of your past. Um, who besides me in here has made mistakes? Okay. Now, whether you've made uh, mistakes for a moment or whether you made mistakes for a decade, the truth is every one of us has a past. We've got regrets. We've got things that we wish we hadn't done. We've got things that we chose poorly uh, we got a past. Now, the Apostle Paul, who wrote these words, had a past. His past included being an antichrist. He got his start persecuting Christians. You know, he, he ruined lives. He chased down innocent people, threw them in prison. He oversaw their execution because they were followers of Jesus. And God interrupted Paul's life and changed him radically. But Paul didn't let his past mistakes and failures and sins define him. He let the love of Christ define him. Paul embraced the mercy of Jesus. He, he embraced forgiveness of sins. And then he moved forward with his life serving God. Doing what he could to lead people to that life-changing relationship with Jesus. Starting churches all over the Roman Empire. Writing letters that became scripture. He's, he wanted to, to redeem his life. But he embraced mercy and grace from Jesus and said, I'm not going to let my past define me. Some of us in this room know our failures. We know them really well and we accept the grace of Jesus and we move forward serving him. But some of us in this room can't forgive ourselves, our past mistakes, and we can't allow God to use our lives. And today, God is telling you that he forgives you. Don't you hear that right now? Let the, let the voice of the Spirit echo in your soul. God forgives you. Scripture says the blood of Jesus cleanses us from all our sin. And God wants you to forget now, he doesn't want you to forget the lessons learned from your mistakes because that's how God redeems our failures. Have you noticed that? We learn how God redeems us and forgives us and then he puts us in places where we help other people on the journey, either to avoid those mistakes or to recover from those same failures. I mean, that's how Jesus is redeemed in our failure. It's a beautiful thing. So he doesn't want you to forget the lessons learned, but he doesn't want you to hold on to that identity, that prison of shame and regret. 
He wants your love relationship with Jesus to define your life and to realize that Jesus paid for those sins on the cross. Whatever they were. They're paid for. They're done. God's not thinking about them. And he wants you to stop thinking about them and living as a prisoner of them. Let your identity be in Christ. That's why we talk about redemption so much. Because we know that God can take your brokenness and your sin and, and completely and totally change your life. We really can start over and follow Jesus to a higher calling, an upward life. So we need to forget our failures, but we also need to forget our successes. Now, that may sound strange to you because some of you are going, wait, I, I like success. I, I admit, I like success. I like winning. Anybody with me? Yeah, see, I, I want to win. But here's the thing. I don't want to live in the fading glow of the victory party. You ever had like one of those big moments of success and you got all your friends together and you threw a party or they threw it for you and, you know, there's confetti everywhere and you're making a mess, you're having a great time. woo it's great. And then, you know, you stay too long and people leave and you're the last one there and you realize, oh, rats, I have to clean up. <laughs> right, and you get the broom out and you're pushing it and you're like, this isn't any fun now. If you stay too long at the victory party, well, it's not any fun. And it's not glorious. We want to celebrate the blessings of God, but we don't want to cherish the plaques and the trophies too much. I confess something to you guys. I don't like plaques. I don't like plaques. I don't know if you get plaques or not. I, I, it doesn't matter if you get a few or a bunch. Uh, to me, plaques are a complete and total waste. Because you can't eat them. You <laughs> know what I'm saying? I mean, don't, give, don't spend money on a plaque. These things cost money. you got to pay for a plaque. And then you can hand it to people. What do you do with it? I'm going to put it on my wall and look at it and celebrate the past victories. Look how good I used to be. I have a plaque to remind me of how good I used to be. What is that? Look, don't give me a plaque. Give me a gift card I can go you know, buy food with and I'll take you to dinner, all right? Let's do that. So don't ever give me a plaque. And I know I'm okay because Chet knows that and, and he takes care of that. So, so, you know, no plaques. But what purpose do they serve? You can have a whole wall of plaques and trophies and you kind of go, yeah, I used to be a wonderful person. I used to be able to do this kind of stuff. You got to take them down and polish them up and say, look at this. This is what I accomplished a long time ago. And we waste energy celebrating the past victories when the battle's not over. The journey's not complete. That's what Paul said, wasn't it? I haven't arrived yet. I haven't taken hold of it yet. I'm still on this journey. I'm still pressing on. I'm straining for what's ahead. So I, I don't want to celebrate too much these past victories. And some of us are so enamored with our past success that we miss out on future opportunities. Like, I am so thankful for what God has done in my life. The blessings that he has poured out in my life, I don't deserve them, and I am grateful for them. I am astounded and delighted at what God has done in the ministry of Calvary. I mean, we just, I mean, God is doing incredible things. We just finished our, our church year, fiscal year, and we baptized more people than ever before in the history of Calvary by about 50% more. Yeah. Isn't that cool? And I don't know if you guys noticed, but there's like this church building going up over on Sweetwater that, you know, it's going to be done around Christmas. And, and that's so cool. And, and I look at that and I go, God is so good and we're going to celebrate that. But there's so much more to come. I got to tell you, to be honest, as much as God has done in the past, I'm more excited about the future than I am about the past. Because here's what's going to happen. There's going to be this wave of people that God sends us, you know, maybe even thousands of people that, that we get to share the gospel with. And I think there's going to be hundreds of decisions to, for people to say, I, I want to follow Jesus. I want him to change my life. And we're going to get to be a part of that if we'll stay faithful and we'll be true to the, the calling that God's given us. And, and the expectation of what he's going to do, it just I, I can't tell you, it, it just thrills me. But here's the biblical theological truth for every single one of us. The best is yet to come. If you're a follower of Jesus Christ, the best is yet to come. I don't care how old you are, how young you are. I don't care if you're excited about the future that you have or if you think your best days are behind you. Here's the reality. If you're a follower of Jesus, the best days are ahead. 
Does not matter your, your life condition. Doesn't matter the pain or what you've been through, uh, any of that, because heaven is what has been promised to us. That's the prize we're living towards. That's why we don't want to get so enamored with our past failures or mistakes that we can't serve God today and tomorrow and as long as he gives us breath because the best is yet to come. And we need to hold on to that because when we hold on to that, we let that truth soak down into our soul and it kind of ekes out all over the people around us. That draws people to Jesus because they see you living with hope. They see you living with life. They see you living with faith. And this world is desperate for authentic relationship with Jesus that changes lives. And if we will hold on to that hope and we will live with the idea that the best days are ahead of us, if we will live well for Christ, if we will die well for Christ, then he's gonna be lifted up and lives are gonna be changed. That's the power of the gospel in this world, in reality. So are you biblically forgetting what lies behind? Or are you trapped by your failures and your successes? Second key that Paul tells us about for this successful journey is pressing on. Pressing on. Verse 14, he continues, I press on. I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Press on. Paul simply reminds his friends, don't give up. Don't quit. Press on. Now, the journey is upward, so it's difficult, right? You ever climb a mountain? You ever walk up a hill? Fly the stairs down at the London Bridge? Yeah, going up's harder than going down, isn't it? Yeah. Hurts more. You run out of breath. Your heart starts beating. It, it's, it's, a lot of times it's painful, but it's worth it. But some of us in this room today are tempted to give up. Some of you are tempted to give up on life. Maybe you failed. Maybe someone failed you. Maybe, you know, you, all you see is darkness and, and you think, yeah, I'd be better off dead. I'd be better off going to next. Uh, by the way, it's never the will of God. It's never the will of God for you to take the shortcut to the end. And the Apostle Paul is saying, look, don't give up. Press on. Some of you are thinking about giving up on marriage. You look at that person that is next to you, that person that you stood before God and witnesses and promised to love forever, and you're thinking, what was I thinking? <laughs> and Paul is saying to you, press on. Don't quit. Some of you are thinking about giving up on God. You're not even sure why you came here today. The songs are sung, and, and you, but you were numb. And you're listening to me talk, but you're going, why am I here? God hasn't delivered on his promises. He hasn't healed my life. He hasn't done the things I asked him to do. Uh, I'm not even sure he loves me. And Paul is saying to you, press on. Why do we not give up? In his letter to the church in Galatia, chapter 6, verse 10, Paul says, And let us not grow weary in doing good, for in due time we shall reap a harvest if we do not give up. If we don't give up. Look, God is as a harvest waiting for you if you don't quit. Your, your marriage is going to get better. Your life is going to get better. Uh, there's going to be changes. God's going to reveal himself to you in a new way and restore your soul if you press on. So today, don't give up. Now, there's another group of people that are not thinking about giving up, but you're sitting here and, well, you're stuck. You're stuck. I mean, you were on the upward journey. You were following Jesus. You got tired along the way. It happens when you're hiking, right? You go, hey, I just need to catch my breath for a minute. I just need to, you know, restore a little bit. I need to rest for a little bit. But instead of resting for a little bit and, and catching your breath, <laughs> you started camping out. <laughs> and then you decided, this is a nice spot. I got a good view and everything. I think I'll build a house here. Put my recliner there, TV, get the remote, a little fridge going. You're waving at people as they're on the journey. Hey, good to see you. You're there. You're in the midst of it, but you're not making any progress. You don't see any spiritual growth. You don't have a hunger for the word. You're not diving into scripture and saying, God, teach me. You're not having conversations with God anymore. You're not serving people in Jesus' name. You're not giving generously. You're just kind of there. And today, 
Paul is saying to you, get up and get back in the game and press on because God has blessings for you. The journey's not over, the battle's not done, and the prize is waiting for us. Will you press on? See, you can't get where you want to go if you quit. You can't get there if you give up. We're following Jesus on an upward journey. We decide what direction our lives are going to go. I don't know what you're going to do, but I'm going to press on. Let's pray. Father, this morning, we thank you that you never give up on us. And because of Jesus Christ and his sacrifice for us, because of your spirit that indwells us, because your love won't let us go, we know that it is well with our souls. And today we want to hear your voice. And whether we're on the journey and we're celebrating the the successes that you've given us or whether we're thinking about quitting life and you and everything else, God, we want to hear you and we want to hear it as well. Father, if we've been stuck for a while, then give us that energy, that that initiative to to start following again, to let you teach our life and heal our life and change us because we need it. We need you for our souls to be well. God, thanks for never giving up on us. Thank you that we are secure in your love. And today we commit ourselves to you because we are going to press on and see the victory We're going to take hold of that prize in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together and worship our God.